right? No, it's called liking people. There was a time when people enjoy other people. They love meeting new people. They love looking people in the face and, 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 and communicating and sharing things that you love or passions you have or, or uh, beliefs or just fun stuff. And something happened. I don't even know when. But something happened where people just kind of close in to themselves, you know, and kind of shut themselves off from human interaction. Even to the point where this is vilified. I have bad news for you guys. This is not assault. <laughs> it's called kindness. You know what I mean? And, and, and being open with people, everybody craves that. If we're all honest, everybody craves that. Everybody wants connection and community. And you wonder, people wonder why the world is so angry. Well, maybe it could have anything to do with the fact that we have turned simple human contact into evil and pervy and vilifying and all of that. I see the correlation. Do you guys, maybe? Absolutely. It's like people are lonelier than ever, and they're all on edge. <clears throat> they're all looking for something to be offended about. Oh my gosh, what a, what a sad way to live. You know? Okay, that was really deep and heavy. <laughs> I'm leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's leaving. We're having a great time. Lock that door. <laughs> Nobody's getting out of here. Yeah, I say so. Um, uh, some people have been asking at the table. Was uh, there's the bros? <laughs> well, well, well. Um, those guys are not related. Anyway, <laughs> they just met here in the convention. Not only. See, I told you. <laughs> um, Trans. A lot of people have been asking me what I'm up to. Uh, and what am I working on? And believe it or not, I am working on things. Um, I, uh, when, when, when COVID hit and pretty much everything shut down, uh, I started doing audiobooks. And uh, I, I was always told by other voice actors that audiobooks are really hard to do, they're very time consuming, as you would imagine, and they don't really pay that much. That's what I was told. So in the back of my mind, I made a little mental note. Right. Don't do audiobooks. Uh, lots of work, not good pay, don't do audiobooks. Well then, COVID hit, and there wasn't much to do, and an author contacted me. They contacted me, I didn't even look for that. And they said, hey, I'd love for you to do my book. And I thought, but audiobooks bad. <laughs> In my mind, I'm hearing my little don't do audio books. But then I thought, you know what? I have a studio in my home. I can throw on a robe, make a cup of coffee, and sit in my studio and record. And so I decided to do it. I agreed to do it. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. You get to play everybody. You know? <laughs> That's really fun. And uh, so I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and then I was contacted by another author. <laughs> and another author, and another author. And so I've done, I don't even know, five or six audiobooks now that are all on um, uh, Audible or iTunes or whatever. So if you're audiobook guys, if you're audiobook guys, check them out. Uh, if you're really audiobook kind of listeners, my mom is, by the way. She loves audiobooks. She, she's listened to thousands. Tells me when I'm really good. And she's not partial in any way. <laughs> right? She's completely objective. <laughs> but uh, the first one is called, for you Star Trek fans, I did an audiobook called These Are the Voyages. It was the audiobook for an amazing uh, series of books about the making of the original series. In fact, my friend back here, John, just showed up with the physical copy of. And, and it's it's really awesome. If you guys like Star Trek, 
I learned, I thought I knew a lot about stuff. And so I read this book, and so much great information about all of the challenges that they went through just to try to make the show. Because I don't know if you guys know this, and we're not going to talk about Star Trek unless you want to. <laughs> and I hope you want to. <laughs> you know, Star Trek panels at 5 o'clock. But um, we're still going to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> I can't help it! Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but the original series of Star Trek was groundbreaking in many, many ways. A lot of you that are younger, you don't even know this. I mean, Star Trek was 60 years ago, and you know Chris Pine and Zach Quinto, and you know, you know some of the newer things, maybe the next gen with Jonathan Frakes, it's kind of cool when he's here, great guy. But the original Star Trek series, there had never been anything like it on television. And I'll tell you a little secret a lot of people don't know. Anybody, you younger people here, uh, are you familiar with an actress for many years, famous comedic actress named Lucille Ball? <laughs> Lucy? Red-haired lady, Lucy? Well, Lucy and her husband, Desi Arnaz, owned a film studio called Desi Lou. And Lucy wanted to make a TV show that had never been made like something completely different. At the time, in the 60s, most television shows were like westerns, or cop shows, or contemporary sitcoms, things like that. And so Lucy sent her directors, her board of directors out, and she said, bring me some shows with a premise that like has not been done. I want to do something new. They brought her two shows. Mission Impossible and Star Trek. And you know what? When they handed her the, the information about Star Trek, you know what they told her? Hey, Lucy, don't make this show. It'll bankrupt your studio. Because the cost of making something that did not exist, think about it. If you're making a cop show, what do you need to make a cop show? Cop cars, uniforms, city streets, Plenty of those around. If you're making a cowboy show, a western, Big Valley, but they have some gun smoke, right? What do you need? Ranches, plenty of those horses. Yeah, we got a few of those, right? Cowboy western gear. Easy peasy. Now think about Star Trek. Nothing exists. No thing. What do they wear in the future? What do they fly? What weapons do they use? What do they eat? Where do they go? I mean, everything has to be created from scratch. And if that's not bad enough, every week they went to a new planet. <laughs> Think about that. Now every week you've got a new young aliens. What do they look like? What do they wear? What do they eat? What kind of ships do they fly? So they, the people that were behind the scenes knew from the very beginning that it was going to be a very expensive, in fact it was, the most expensive show on television at the time. And the reason that it was ultimately canceled was not because it wasn't popular, it was because it was too expensive, and the network was trying to kill it from the very beginning, it was like it's too expensive. So they kept putting it in crappy time slots and on weird days of the week just to kill the viewership so that they would have a good reason to say, oh, well, see, look, it's not doing very well. Well, yeah, that's because it's on at 3 a.m. on Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, enough about Star Trek. Until a minute from now. <laughs> um, so I, I, that audio book, These Are the Voyages, and then uh, I did a book called In Plain Sight by Dan Willis. Uh, it's a cool kind of a crime drama that's part historical and also kind of part wizard, um, magic, kind of a cool, interesting uh, blend of those two. Then I did a, a book called The Crimson Spark, which is so, and you, and he was like, I love you. <laughs> I'm not kidding, I love that book. And you're gonna be very pleased to know that I'm currently recording the sequel. Yes! It's so good! <laughs> it really is. It's a big fantasy novel, The Crimson Spark, check it out. Uh, then I did a, a, a book called Paper Doll, which is a great kind of historical uh, World War II set drama. 
that follows this family and it's based on all true stories. In fact, the author is here this weekend. Uh, Brian Peterson, check him out. Go say hi in his booth. In fact, this is his wife right here, Mindy. She came in here to make sure I talked about his book. <laughs> uh, and then, the, let's see, the, the, then I did a, just finishing up another book by Brian Peterson called The Nova Quadrant, which is a sci-fi, a uh, very, very cool sci-fi action story. Um, those of you that are interested in voice acting and, and the voice work that I've done, um, I have just finished directing uh, an, an original animated series, and I'm playing roles in that as well. And for those of you that follow kind of news, uh, current events in the anime world, um, there is an amazing convention in Houston called Anime Matsuri, and it's enormous and beautiful, fantastic, one of my favorite events. And we started a new dubbing studio. And uh, they are currently negotiating licenses with, uh, with studios in Japan. And we'll be acquiring some licenses for new anime series. And I'll be directing and voice acting in those. So uh, exciting stuff coming there, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, in fact, this year, Anime Monster is in Houston, and we've got some big announcements planned for that. Uh, working on some new music. Those of you that know that I do music uh, professionally, so we've got we've got some new music coming out, and uh, some on-camera stuff, and uh, coming to see you. So uh, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful to be here, and. Uh, Anything you guys want to talk about, I'm going to open the, the floor up to anybody that has a question. So let's get started with our favorite karaoke master here. <laughs> he says that, but he's had yet to hear me. Oh, but I've heard the stories. <laughs> Someday love will find you. I sang that last night. I'll overdo it if you don't show up tonight. If I don't show up tonight. All them two are guys. If you find out that I was killed somewhere, this is the guy I look for. <laughs> He's oh my suspect God. number one right here. What's your question? That's not unfortunate. <laughs> okay, so obviously since your work was Star Trek continued. Thank you. Um, Star Trek Phase 2, you played at the Klingon. Yeah, I directed it, I'm just saying. Uh, um, um, what was it like being a <laughs> Because I can tell you absolutely enjoy it. Well, yeah, it's always fun being evil. <laughs> Especially if you're not really evil. You know? I mean, that's one of the most fun things about acting, right? I mean, to play characters that are not like you. Right? If you play yourself, then, you know, you can only go so far with that. But it's fun to play characters that are different. And uh, that was, he was a lot of fun. Um, I was asked to direct that episode. I directed it, it was called Katumba. And who were they, the Katumba was the, uh, the leader of the Klingon people. That was the name of the, the uh, episode. But if you guys have not seen my Star Trek, you're like, why are we still talking about Star Trek? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> what? Have you really? I watched you up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love your shirt, too. Yeah. It's over now, I Which, by the way, if you guys haven't seen Star Trek continues, I highly recommend it. Please check it out. Yeah, that's my shameless plug for Star Trek Continues.com. Uh, we rebuilt the entire sound stage from the original series and created not 11 full length episodes. Those of you that are even near my age, will know that when Star Trek, the original Star Trek was on television, what did Captain Kirk say at the very beginning of every episode? John? These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds. I mean, but seek out new life, new civilizations, right? What we over know is not important. Well, they were canceled in her third season of television. And then the next time you saw Captain Kirk, 
Spock, all those characters was 10 years later in Star Trek The Motion Picture. So my thought was, hey, why don't we rebuild all the sets and let's pick up right where the series was canceled and finish the five-year mission of the Enterprise and then even leave everyone right where they were when the motion picture comes out. So it's a beautiful closure to arguably, I know I'm partial, but it doesn't mean I'm wrong, <laughs> the most iconic show in television history. Like you said, it was, in many ways. I mean, here we are still making Star Trek 60 years later. You know, All new TV shows like, and you know what's funny is that I, I have not good authority from uh, people who know inside the official uh, halls of people that own Star Trek. And even now with all of the subsequent series, the original series, Next Gen, uh, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Discovery, all of it, all the movies, the original series is still the most popular. More merchandise, more, more uh, enthusiasm around the original series than any of the other series. So, check out StarTrekContinues.com. Here's the best part. It's free. You're like, woo! -hoo! I hate Star Trek and I'm still gonna go. <laughs> because it's free. No, it was all made as a labor of love. Um, I loved that show when I was a little boy, and so making this series and fulfilling kind of my childhood dream of playing my hero uh, was just my my gift back to Star Trek. My, my way of saying thank you for what you gave so many people when we were younger and inspired us in so many ways. Who's got a question? Oh, come on! I know you have questions. Yes. What is your personal favorite quote from Star Trek? It can be from these. Oh gosh. <laughs> How did you ask? What's your favorite hair on your head? <laughs> like, how can you? Oh. I tell you what, you know what? I'm throwing it down right now. I just thought of one. Don't get scared, because I'm about to quote Star Trek. For you, okay? <laughs> this guy's a super nerd. Gotcha. But I'm in your company, right? Yeah. Um, there was my favorite episode of the original series. It's a very obscure episode. If you're a Star Trek fan, you, you may know it, but if you're not, you would know. It's the third season episode uh, called Requiem for Methuselah. And it was an episode about the Enterprise had this, uh, there was a, a disease going around needed to, to find a, a planet that had this, this uh, I want to say mineral, but something that they, could, that they needed to use to make a vaccine. So they went to this planet that they thought was deserted. There was a guy that lived there by himself. They didn't know he was there. And, uh, and then, come to find out, he has this kind of a daughter, younger woman that lives there with him. And of course, Kirk falls in love with her. <laughs> As he does, right? And uh, and I'm not going to give it away, but it's a really great, great story. And there was a scene, Kirk, let's just say Kirk behaved very badly, which is atypical. Usually heroes in television shows in the 60s did no wrong, right? They always saved the day, they always got the girl, they always had the answers. Squeaky clean hero. And I was particularly moved by the fact that Kirk did not behave very well, and he knew it. It was one of the first episodes, that was actually why it was my favorite, was because you saw a side of the squeaky clean Captain Kirk that you never saw. He was sitting in his quarters at the very end of the episode, just forlorn, sitting at his desk, and, and Spock walks in, and Kirk says, uh, a very old and lonely man, and a young and lonely man. We put on a pretty poor show here. If only I could forget. And he lays his head down on the desk and falls asleep because he's so exhausted. 
and Dr. McCoy walks in. And McCoy sees Kurt's head on his desk and Spock standing there. And McCoy goes, well, thank God, sleeping at last, you know. He looks at Spock and he says something, one of the most beautiful little moments. Remember Spock, right? Mr. Vulcan, no emotions, right? All that, right? And McCoy says, considering talking about Kirk, looking at Kirk and says, considering his opponent's longevity, truly an eternal triangle. And they look at Spock and he says, who would understand that word is Spock? Because the word, oh, because uh, he says, you see, I, oh, this is it. He goes, he goes, you see, I feel sorrier for you than I do for him. Because you'll never know what love can drop on him to. The glorious failures, the glorious victories, the desperate chances, all these things you'll never know. Simply because the word love is a word. And he starts to leave and he looks, turns around and looks at Kirk and says, I do wish he could forget her. Because Kirk is with him. So McCoy leaves and Spock walks over to Kirk, sleeping on the desk, and puts his hand on his head and says, forget. And he makes Kirk forget. It's so beautiful. I love it. I love it. Okay. That's what you get for asking me that question. <laughs> well, I was hoping for a five second answer. Question. Who's that one? Yes. So, two-part. Uh, what action comes with voice acting? Uh, I got into voice acting quite by accident. Um, I'm always very, very quick to give God all the credit for my career. Um, and I don't say that like, um, you know, there are a lot of things out there that if you just put in the work, and you just stick with it, and you're tenacious, and you're driven, and you just keep at it, you'll, you'll accomplish whatever it is you set out to accomplish. My voice acting career was a pure gift. I had no thought of being a voice actor. I didn't even really ever think about it. I guess if you asked me one day, hey, you know real guys come in and record those voices of those animated shows, right? I'd be like, yeah, I get it. yeah, sure, I get it. But I never really thought about that as a job. I've done a lot of theater. I've been doing a lot of acting since I was very young. And I was living in Houston, Texas about 25 years ago, and I was working on a video production. And one of the guys that I was working with said to me, hey, um, you've got a lot of acting experience, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, you should go and audition for this place in town. They, it's this little studio, and they buy these Japanese animated shows, and they dub them into English, and they're looking for actors. All I heard was, they're looking for actors. <laughs> because if you love acting, right, you love any opportunity to do what you love. So I didn't ask him, now, how much does it pay? I don't care. Am I gonna be famous? I don't care. It, it wasn't about any of that. It was about getting to do something you love. You know, how many of you like draw, love to draw? A lot of artists in here. If somebody comes to you and goes, hey, could you draw this for me? You'd be like, well, I can't do it. No, you want to do it. Like, you, you love doing things that, that you enjoy. So for me, voice acting just seems, well, that could be fun. That might be fun. So I went audition, and I got cast as Vega in Street Fighter II. Yeah, that's taking you back, isn't it? <laughs> he was the matador kind of guy, the Spanish guy with the claw and the mask and stuff. And uh, it was fun, and it was weird. <laughs> it's weird to hear your voice come out of an animated character's face. It's weird. But I did it, and it was a lot of fun. And I remember leaving the studio thinking, well, that was a really interesting, random, one-time thing to do. I'll probably never get to do it again, but it was fun. And a few weeks later, they called me and said, hey, uh, we have this other show called Neon Genesis Evangelion. Do you want to come and play a role in that? And I'm like, okay. okay. So I went back and did that, and 
then a few weeks later, they called me and said, hey, we're doing this other show called Excel Saga. <laughs> you want to come be in that? I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just took the chance on the Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, a few weeks later, they called and said, hey, we're doing this other show called The Des Martian Successor, The Desico. <laughs> you want to play a role? And then, and then another show, and another show, and another show, and another show, and it just kind of snowballed. You see why I give God the glory? Because I didn't do anything. I didn't send out a bunch of audition tapes. I didn't mail out a bunch of headshots. I didn't walk up and down, you know, studio doors trying to get in. A door opened, and I just kind of stepped in. I had no idea what was on the other side. And then as the industry, and by the way, when I started, the anime industry was very small. Like, very small. And in fact, when we would record these shows, I didn't even know what they did with them. Like, I figured they probably sold them, right? Because that's the only way you make enough money to make another one. But I had no idea what they did with them, and I didn't really care. Because it was fun. Acting was fun. So, the next thing I know, I get invited to an anime convention. <laughs> now you guys, when I was little, I went to Star Trek conventions. You're like, no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding, really? Um, but I didn't even know they had conventions for anime. They do now. <laughs> but back then, back then, did you guys know, let's talk Star Trek again. Did you know that the only reason there are Comic Cons is because of Star Trek? The very first Comic-Cons were Star Trek conventions. Star Trek literally pioneered the fans getting together to celebrate something they love. And all of the other Comic-Cons and fandom events spiraled off of Star Trek conventions. I have a program, y'all, don't get scared. I have a program from a Star Trek convention I went to in 1973. I know, right? Is it crazy? What? <laughs> I love you, bro. I love you. So I went to this anime convention not knowing what to expect, and I was blown away to see merchandise of characters that I had played. Like, I didn't even know it existed. And fans would come and go, who would you I'm like, I know this guy! I played him! And I didn't even realize these like wall scrolls and action figures and pencil boards and all kinds of cool things. And then I met people from other studios. I didn't even know there were other studios. <laughs> and somebody from a studio said, hey man, you want to play a, a role in Dragon Ball? And I was like, okay. <laughs> What's Dragon Ball? <laughs> I had no idea. But I like that thing. And uh, so I started doing more with that studio and then another studio. Hey, you want to play a role in uh, Naruto? Bleach? One Piece? Vampire Night? Okay, okay, okay. And then another studio in New York. You want to come be in Pokemon? Okay. <laughs> it was completely just opportunities that, that opened themselves and uh, I was incredibly grateful. I, I have been incredibly grateful. And uh, despite, despite any events of the last few years, um, I consider myself incredibly blessed. You know, you can either focus on things that you feel like you were mistreated or you were done wrong, or things didn't go the way you wanted them to, or whatever. Or you can focus on all you have to be grateful for. Because on your worst day, you have a lot to be grateful for. Can you see me right now? You know why? Because you have eyes that work. And you can take in the world. Can you hear me? You didn't, you didn't, you didn't make those ears. You didn't build those ears. And air in your lungs. You didn't earn that breath. You know what I mean? We are, we are blessed with a lot of gifts that we take for granted every day because you go to sleep at night just expecting to wake up the next morning, right? It's all gift. It's all gift. 
And I would encourage you guys to, when you have bad days or when you're discouraged, down, try to focus on all of them. You know, instead of the little laundry list of things that didn't go your way, look at the huge list of things that you have to be thankful for. Friends, loved ones, muscles that you can move, food, clothing. I know that seems kind of crazy, but there are plenty of places around the world people don't have a lot of that. So we have a lot to be thankful for. That's the point. And I consider my my career something to be very, very grateful for. Question? Yes. I'm not Ruto, brother. <laughs> um, how much of your work did you improvise? Oh. <laughs> much. Uh, occasionally, of course, occasionally. Sometimes, um, <coughs> sometimes, okay, I'm trying to get how I want to describe this. When a company gets this, uh, the license to a Japanese animal, the Japanese company will send them the animation, which is already done, right? And then they'll send them the script in Japanese. No, I don't speak Japanese. I don't read Japanese. I love Japanese food. That's about as far as I go. Um, but then somebody who knows Japanese will take that Japanese script and they will adapt it into English, right? And then actors will be hired to play the roles. We come in, record the lines, we put it all together, and release it. However. When a, when a writer, if this young lady is writing the, the adaptation for an anime, right? For instance, let's say she was hired to adapt scripts for Full Metal Alchemist. And she writes, and she's sitting in her, in her house with her laptop, and she's watching the, the episode, and she's seeing the character's mouth move, and then she's referencing it with the script. And so she needs to write a line that says what this line says and fits the mouth flaps of the character. And usually a direct translation never fits. Ever. <laughs> like it takes a lot more time and words in Japanese to say something than it does in English. So the, the tricky part is that she may write a line that fits perfectly in her mind, but she's not the actor. When the actor comes into the studio, he may speak faster than she speaks. He may speak slower than she speaks. And suddenly, the line that she wrote doesn't fit. And so a lot of times, you have to make tiny little adaptations to the lines to make the match best. That, that's the vast majority of Advent that we may do. There are only a very few examples that I know of of uh, anime series where they just went crazy. Ghost stories <laughs> would be one. Um, where the, the, the Japanese company basically told ABB Films, hey, this show did not do well in Japan, so have at it, do whatever you want. That's a bad thing to tell people. <laughs> that's going to go off the rails really quick. But it did. I mean, they just, they had a field day with ghost stories. Making fun of each other and other voice actors. Me, of course. People like to make fun of me. I don't <laughs> but, uh, but I actually played a role in it as well. But, um, but then sometimes, most times, the Japanese companies that own these these shows, they, have, they care a lot about how their show is presented. They're very, you know what I mean? They, they, they have great reverence for their, their work. And they don't want it ad lib. They don't want you making up your own junk, right? They want it true to what they created. In fact, a little, little known uh, bit of information for you here. One of the reasons why you don't see a lot of blooper reels 
on anime discs of series is because the Japanese don't like you making fun of their show. Now, you may not think it's making fun. We know, right, that in Western culture, we, we get parody, we get satire and having fun and making jokes. I mean, I make jokes about Star Trek all the time, and I love Star Trek. That's just, you know, we take it as a joke. But there are other people that take their work very seriously. And they don't want actors making fun. They don't want them putting words in this character's mouth that that character would not say. So that's why you don't see a lot of blooper reels on, on anime series. You see them occasionally, but not very often. And that's one of the reasons. Question? Yes. Uh, you, sir. <laughs> I was playing Persona 3 Polvo a few months ago. Junpei! And one of the lines was, talk to us! What's that? Dot com toothpaste? So that comes to thinking. How does that both think, Junpei? I love Junpei. I love that character. Um, in fact, somebody came today. Are you in here? It happens to you and your, your friend. Yes. She's a friend that I talked to on the phone, and uh, she's, she's a Persona fan. And so I, I was able to pull out my Junpei picture, but I love Junpei. I love that character. Especially, what was the one with the baseball? Um, what was it? The, the baseball one? Where he's... Which, which one was That would it? be Ultimax, I believe. Yes, yes. Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. And then, yes. Junpei, level up. Question? Yes. Yes. What was your favorite role? Oh, girl. Favorite role? <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> I only have 10 minutes left? That's impossible. We just started. <laughs> Close that door. <laughs> no, I Nobody's allowed to leave. Um, I did a lot of musical theater. did a lot of musical theater. Um, a lot of classic musicals. Like Camelot. Fiddler on the Roof, Oliver, Annie, Your Good Man Charlie Brown, <laughs> Guys and Dolls. Yeah, I, I love, I love the The Crucible, yes. Arthur Miller. I actually did The Crucible twice, and I played John Proctor the first time, who was the lead guy, and then the second time I played Reverend Paris, who was the smarmy little reverend of the church. Um, which was really fun because when I played Proctor the first time, you're working with all the other actors and you're getting an idea of their characters and then suddenly you get to do the show again later and you get to play that guy. And so you have your own ideas about, oh, if I ever got to do that guy, that's what I would love to do. First time. So, I love theater. I still, I still want to do more of it. I, I just finished doing the Christmas musical in, in Dallas. Um, with theater, and if anyone's got any theater, you know what I'm talking about. It's very time consuming. And most people don't really pay for theater. Like, it's, again, that's a labor of love. There are very, very few people that make a living <laughs> acting. And I include voice acting in that. Um, especially theater. It's one of those things you have to love it <laughs> and be willing to do it and put the time in just because you have a passion for it. Oh god. You mean like what like theater dream role or theater I would love honestly I would love to do Lake Miz. I would love to do Phantom. I know those are older, but I would love to be in a Yeah, I just would love it. And um have you done any theater? Yes, I actually <laughs> my favorite role I've ever done is in Big Fish. I know Big Fish, sure. I got to play the witch, even though COVID <laughs> Question? Yes, sir. All right, so out of the two Brolins, which one do you like the most? I like the new Broly. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. No. I'm sorry, you like the OG, don't you? I love the OG too, bro. But, you know, tell me, you know what? Do you know what I like the most about the new Broly? He doesn't say that. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about it, but that's a really good reason. <laughs> no, you know what I love about the new Broly? Uh, Is they gave him more backstory. Yes. You feel 
feel like you understand him a little more. You know what I mean? He's just not this big lumbering, you know, personified destruction. You know? He's not just this homicidal maniac who destroys planets because the baby next to him was crying. <laughs> I know, right? But but in the new Dragon Ball Super Rogue, the kid in this whole backstory. And you feel for him. You actually you have sympathy for this character because his dad abuses him, right? With the shock collar and the way he was raised and manipulated and controlled. You're like, man, this this poor guy. He fights because his dad tells him to fight. He doesn't even know why he's fighting. Like he, he's he's so taken advantage of. Now I love it. He kind of reminds me of like Frankenstein, like Frankenstein's monster, right? Didn't mean he didn't mean harm. He just he was put together poorly, and he doesn't understand the way we understand. And you know he 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 wants to like you and he breaks your neck by accident. You know and he doesn't mean harm. Um, I love that. That's why I love the new road. Yes? How, how did you come up with the body voice of the How did you call them? Well, I mean, they called me one day and said, this is over the phone, by the way. <laughs> so imagine how boring this must be. So somebody called me and said, hey man, you want to be in Dragon Ball D? I'm like, sure, what's Dragon Ball? What's that? Yeah. And they're like, oh, there's this character named Broly and a movie eight, legendary Super Saiyan. And they, they called me and they said, can you do like a low, deep, evil voice? Now this, this is my voice, right? <laughs> it hurt. Yeah, it did. And, uh, and so I, I, mean, I said, you know, like right now? <laughs> On the phone? Like how scary is that going to be, right? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, just do something. And I, you know, I was like, what do you want me to say? And, uh, and they're like, the guy on the phone was like, okay, that was good. Okay. <laughs> All right, and they scheduled me to go up and I recorded it. Now, what I didn't know was that Dragon Ball is pure torture for your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize that at the time either, because I didn't know what Dragon Ball was. And so I went up there, and of course Broly, you know, speaks for 20 seconds, and then he fights and screams and yells and powers up for two hours. And so I was going at it because I had never done anything like that. Like I had done probably 30 or 40 different shows at this point, but nothing like that. Nothing just pure screaming, blinding rage all the time. So I didn't know to pace yourself. And I just went in there and I was loose. And within about an hour, I sounded like this. I was like, oh crap. I don't have another cat around in me. And so they're like, go home. Come back next week. So I literally went back home and uh, convalesced for two weeks and drank lots of water. And didn't talk, yes, lots of throat coat, lots of, of uh, cough drops, and, uh, and didn't talk much. And then I went back up and recorded the rest of the movie, knowing a little better now. But at least at the end of the movie, I was like, oh, thank God. Thank God I made it through that movie, and he's finally dead. <laughs> I know why you're laughing. Because nobody dies in Dragon Ball. And so he just kept coming back. And, uh, so I love playing the character, but he just, I, I always like to say, I love Broly, but he just doesn't love me that. Yeah, he, was, he was rough. He was rough on the, on the voice, but I really enjoyed playing. Yes? Um, so my top three favorite characters in the voice were Broke and Ruby. Oh, uh, nice. Tom McKean, Warren, Warren, Nice, even nicer. Uh, and from Thank you, Captain. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, this is really easy. For the longest time, when people would ask me, what's your favorite character? I would look them over, and if they were wearing like a, a cosplay, or they had a, you know, an Oron bag, 
or they were dressed like a character from Vampire Night. You know, I would take a cue. If I'm looking at the back of their phone and I see something, I'm like, ah, oh, they like one piece. Me trying to be the fan friendly guy that I am, I'm like, oh, I like one piece. And so oh, yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> and so I did that for a long time. Until we finished the last episode of Brotherhood. As I was recording the last scene with Ed and and Winry in the train, I was like, okay, I, I can't I can't deny it anymore. I love Full Metal Alchemist. <coughs> Ed was my favorite thing I ever did. Um, having said that, Kamaki is a very close second place. <laughs> And he doesn't, he doesn't have short rants, so that makes him better. <laughs> because he talks more smoothly and romantically, <laughs> as opposed to... Who are you calling this way? That hurts a little too. Questions? <laughs> I know we're so running out of time, and I hate that. Will you come back to the Star Trek panel? I hate Star Trek. <laughs> we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. I love talking with you guys. And I, and I don't know, are these only half hour panels? Yeah. Didn't I come in here at 1 o'clock? Yes. Yeah. How was it 10 to 2? <laughs> Dad, come in. Yes. I know, right? <laughs> what was my favorite thing about Edward? <laughs> How tall he was. <laughs> uh, my favorite thing about Ed, honestly, was his love for his brother. Um, I don't know the child. And uh, I always used to tell myself, if I could have a younger brother or an older brother or a younger sister or an older sister, if I could choose, I would want to have a younger brother. Because I would love to, like, teach him to play ball and you know what I mean and, and kind of be like a, an older brother that he could look up to and, and and you know teach him things that I learned and we could have fun together and stuff. And so when I found out that you know the whole story is kind of predicated upon these two brothers and everything they lost and how they end up having to stick together in all the loss and the challenges that they face. That was the part that I liked the most. In fact, my favorite lines that I ever said for Full Metal were the scenes between Ed and Al, when Al, Ed was not being a cocky little jerk. You know what I mean? <laughs> he wasn't like up in somebody's face or flipping out because somebody called him a shrimp or whatever. But it was those quiet, you know, those quiet scenes with Al when you. You, you hear a little bit more of the uncertainty. Like, I don't know if we can do this out. I don't know if we have, we're strong enough. That's what I do, is that, what's the word, vulnerability, you know what I mean? That openness, those moments, and, and you know, his their commitment to each other, and trying to get their bodies back, and just, ugh, love that show. It's like love that show. Like for me, within the very core of that ranking, pipsqueak midget, there's actually a heart. Oh yeah, very much so. A full metal. See what I did there? <laughs> I love that one. That reminds me. There's that one scene in, in the original. There's that one scene in the original Full Metal where he's climbing through the air conditioning ducts. You guys remember this? He's climbing through this. He's, he's, yeah, he's crawling through this air conditioning duct, and like nobody would be able to do this, right? It's too tall. And he's climbing through it, sneaking into this house, and he goes, eh, it's actually good that I'm so small. <laughs> and then one split second later, he goes, what? no, it's not! <laughs> it's like he catches himself saying that it's really good that he's so small. In fact, we talked about this yesterday in the panel with Quentin, 
Any, were you guys, any, were you guys there? I was. Yeah, uh, yeah Quinn and I did a panel yesterday uh, about like Bleach and, and some of the different shows that we had done. And when you when you have to yell a lot, you don't want to do it any more than you absolutely necessary, right? Like you don't want to have to yell Kakarot over and over and over again because you keep distorting the microphone because you're yelling so loud, right? So the very first time that I screamed, like, like for instance, the very first short rant that I ever did, um, the, <laughs> you know, the little needle that shows you the, how strong the, the level is coming in, it was like, Who do you call the bitch with? <laughs> You know, the little chunks of blood coming out because I'm screaming so loud. And the, and the, uh, and the recording engineer's like, Oh, sorry, dude. That was, I got, we need to do another one. That was too loud. <laughs> so for the next three years, whenever I'd go to record Full Metal and there was ever any yelling, I would look through the window at the, at the sound engineer and go, You ready for this? <laughs> Turn it down, way down. <laughs> I don't want to have to do this too many times, right? So um, yes, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of that. Hey, she hasn't come back. Yet. <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking until she, until she chases me out. Yes, so if Naruto was fully untapped and you could have had any role in it that you wanted, who would you want it? Oh wow. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> um, if I could have played any character in Naruto, answering the question, basically. If I said, oh, I wish I could have played Sasuke, well, I don't want Yuri Lowenthal to think that I think he did a crappy job as Sasuke, you know what I mean? So I, I, I don't really lament much or think much about other characters that I, that I wish I could have played, mostly because, like we talked about, of bringing it full circle, being grateful. Mostly because I'm so grateful for the opportunities I do get um, and I, you come to f find something you love about every character you play. And that's really the key. You know, you can kind of phone it in and just read the line into the microphone, be done, collect your check, go home. Or you can really take pride in it, you know, and, and really want it to be the best it can be. It doesn't matter how big or small the, the character may be. Um, I have thoroughly loved every opportunity I've ever had. Um, I played at least five or six characters in Naruto because there were so many characters. The show was so big and they ran out of voice actors, I guess. <laughs> so we all ended up doing a few. But um, I'm, I loved Obito and Nagato. And, uh, and then in Rock Lee, I got to play Orange Mario, which was really fun. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to stick with my own guys because I wouldn't want to undermine anyone else's work. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Back to you. Um, outside of Kurt, what's a live action role that you've done that you love? Wow. Kind of including YouTube. I've done several things. Um, 
Anybody see the Silent Hill thing that I did? Oh, that was a lot of fun. The live action Silent Hill. Apparently there's this character in Silent Hill named James Sunderton. Sunderland. James Sunderland apparently you look a lot alike. So. <laughs> Lucky for me. Um, but uh, I've done that and then I've, I've done several other. Do I have five minutes? Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, it's Wolfrier? Oh my gosh, oh, it's, oh, that's right, I sorry. forgot. I'm so sorry, There's gonna be another here. Um, what was the question? <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, after you get to play your childhood hero, it's all downhill from there. You know I mean? <laughs> hey everybody, uh, thank you so much for coming, I love y'all. If I have not gotten a chance to meet you yet, please come over and say hi.